Sweden's unorthodox approach to handling the health crisis has made headlines throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Unlike most EU members, the Swedes didn't impose any strict lockdown measures. It remained business as usual in Stockholm and elsewhere, even when cases peaked there and opinions became more divided than ever. While the relaxed strategy is expected to ease the impact on the economy, Sweden has one of Europe's highest fatality rates and the worst death toll by far in Scandinavia. What went wrong and what should have been done differently? Some of the questions we put to one of the leaders in the battle against COVID-19, Sweden's Minister for Health and Social Affairs, Lena Hallengren, talks to Al Jazeera. Sweden's Minister for Health and Social Affairs, Lena Hellingran, uh, thanks for joining us and for talking to Al Jazeera. Can I just begin with the government motto during the COVID-19 pandemic, which was physical distancing, not social distancing. Was that the best policy, considering the latest figures from Sweden suggest that you've had nearly 6,000 deaths and nearly 80,000 infections? Well, let me say that we have had a situation in Sweden which has been as problematic as many other countries. I mean, this is a global pandemic with a virus which uh, we knew very little about from the beginning. Now we know a lot more. Uh, so, uh, of course, it has been a very difficult time. Uh, and all uh, during those, I think it's six months since we had the first uh, infected case in Sweden, uh, we have been working very hard and I just want to take every opportunity I can to say that in Sweden we didn't have business as usual in any way. We had a physical distance, uh, we had uh, so many changes. Mm. So if you will uh, visit Sweden and talk to, to the people in Sweden, they will say that so many things has been different change and they still are. Uh, that doesn't mean that, of course, it's such sadness that we can uh, that, that we know that more than 5000 people have have uh, deceased uh, in Sweden during this time that okay. is a fact okay so the the covid-19 virus was identified in december in china the WHO declared it an outbreak of international concern on the 30th of January, and then they called it a pandemic on the 11th of March. Just take us back to uh, the Swedish government now realising that this virus could be on its way. What sort of conversations are you having with the Prime Minister and with other senior health officials? Well, of course, this has been an ongoing discussion, dialogue, uh, very serious uh, talks, of course, uh, within the government, both with Prime Minister, but also with our national agency, uh, the Public Health Agency, which has been our uh, expert authority uh, when it comes to, to uh, prevent disease. Uh, from the 1st of February, it was classified in Sweden as a dangerous to society. Uh, so since then, we have activated and made it possible for, for everyone uh, working with uh, disease control uh, nationally and regionally to, to take all the measures they need to make sure that they can protect uh, the society and, and vulnerable groups. Uh, it, it seems that the Prime Minister himself uh, decided to hand over the responsibility, as you say, to the scientists of the Department of Public Health under Anders Tegnell, the state epidemiologist, uh, with, again, the phrase of uh, lagom, pardon my Swedish, uh, the, the, the light touch, um, or just enough. Again, is, was, it, was it the right thing to do to allow the scientists to have full control, or did the Prime Minister, did you, as, as Minister... Uh, for public health, have also some responsibility in keeping the reins very tight on, on the way um, the government were going to control the public at large? I don't think that's uh, a right uh, description, really, because we have a national agency called the Public Health Agency in Sweden, and all the time, 30, 365 days a year, they are responsible for disease prevention and control. And I think it would be very strange if they are responsible all the time, but not when we have a pandemic with a new virus, which has been a fight for all the countries, 
But of course, we didn't leave all responsibility to them, but they are the experts. And of course, they are very important advisors. They also the one having all the contacts with the WHO, with other countries, with the national health agencies in the Nordic countries, not least, but also in other countries uh, in the European Union. So we have had lots of uh, dialogue, very close dialogue uh, with the agency. And of course, it is the government making decisions on uh, uh, changing law, uh, having recommendations. Uh, uh, we will come to them, I guess, in the interview, but we have had lots of, of uh, not only recommendations and guidelines and information to make sure that people change their behaviors and the way of living their everyday life. And that has been a responsibility for the agency, for the government, for the prime minister, for me, but also for 10 million Swedes. Some people in the international community do find it odd that Sweden being such a well-organized, thoughtful uh, country that leads from the front, uh, when you think of Sweden, you think of accuracy, that you or, or the government and the public health department decided that this light touch, this herd immunity or this herd mentality was the way forward. Can you sort of elaborate on why you thought the light touch was the way forward when other countries were locking down very quickly? I think that's wrong to describe it that way. And I will probably say that many times because I think, I think it is. Uh, because Sweden didn't have some kind of goal to have herd immunity, and we are trying to say that for so many times, so I, I try to repeat it. Uh, that is not the strategy. The strategy has been to make sure that we can uh, prevent the virus from being spread in society, uh, to protect vulnerable groups, but also to make sure that our society uh, is functioning, uh, because all the time we need people to work in the hospitals, we need people to work in the nursing homes. We need people to work in the pharmacies, in the as police officers, uh, in the ambulance, but also in, in the shops that you can make everything you need uh, working in, in uh, community trains, uh, buses. I mean, we don't find it in a Swedish perspective possible that everyone is staying home for months, not uh, going outside, uh, not uh, having fresh air, not uh, having any physical um, activities. So for us, it has been very important to change uh, people's everyday life, to take all the measures we need to make sure that they don't travel around, that everyone who has a possibility to work from home, they have done. All the students in the upper secondary schools, the universities and the high schools, they have been studying online all the people uh, working in, in, in the cultural sector or in, uh, in activity or sports, they have been working, uh, or actually they have not been working because we haven't had those kind of gatherings. So I really protest to say that <laughs> it hasn't been on a, such a light way. I think that's, that's a way for other countries to describe Sweden. But if you let us describe our strategy, that is not the way we describe it. But it has been a very delicate balance to allow sort of social movement alongside protecting the economy. And in protecting the economy, you know, we're looking at 80,000, nearly 80,000 infections in a population of, what, 10.3 million. So that's, per capita, it's, it's quite large and therefore quite worrying that that policy was used. Do you regret not tightening things up a little bit more? You can give me any more example if you want to, but I think that is that is not really uh, the right way to, to describe it because we are testing as much as we can to make sure that that we really know how many people are infected, how can we make sure that they are is isolated, that they stay at home. I don't know all the figures from other countries, but uh, I mean protecting a country from a virus. Of course, we have doing we have done whatever we found was possible or necessary, but I think that the thing which has been maybe uh, a difference uh, or maybe the most important difference from other countries was the fact that we didn't close the primary school or the, the preschool and, and the primary care. I would say that has been the biggest difference as well as the fact that people were not forbidden to go outside, but if they were outside, they were supposed to have a distance. And I can just assure you, uh, if you were in Sweden in March, April, May, 
you have not many people to talk to. You have closed shops, restaurants, boutiques, mm. because no one went there. So we have reached the goals we wanted to make sure that you uh, make people have a social distance, work from home, study from home, not meet in any uh, big gatherings. Uh, that has been the most important thing. But that doesn't mean that we haven't made a lot of, of changes uh, in the Swedish society. I think that is a misunderstanding, really. OK, well, one, one of the issues, certainly, uh, when, you, when we talk about the, the, the death rates, is that a large proportion of that death rate is uh, old-age people, maybe many of them in care or living by themselves at home. Let's just talk about those that were in care. Um, what's been the main problem? Uh, it's estimated, certainly by the Swedish press, that as many as 2,500 may have died in care homes. Where do you think the problem lies there and what loopholes need to be closed? Because that's a very large number. I'm not sure about the, the viewers of this programme if they are aware of, of what a nursing home in Sweden is. So let me explain that. That is a place for the, the oldest one, the most fragile one, often people with dementia. Uh, in general, people live in, in those nursing homes for one, two or maybe three years. So, of course, you have the people when they get the virus, they are the most um, the, the most vulnerable ones. But as far as I know, uh, globally, the elderly part of the population is the one suffering hardest. And in Sweden, we have a situation where the, the oldest part of the population, they don't live at home. Uh, they live at those nursing homes. So, uh, I mean, that is, of course, something which I... I think it's, as I said before, it's extremely sad, but I don't think it's that unique as it might be described, but we have an organization in Sweden where those nursing homes, they are not just, you know, retired people. Um, but were they given, were, they, were, were the nursing homes given guidance as to how to protect themselves from coronavirus? Were the nursing homes given personal protective equipment? Uh, yes. How was the virus entering nursing homes? Was it from, how was it in terms of staff or suppliers to the nursing home? Uh, because those are the loopholes that need to be, to be tightened up, surely. Yes, they, they had uh, access to PPE if you were working in the, in the uh, nursing home in the elder care sector. But, but it was a fact in the beginning of this pandemic, uh, it was extremely uh, difficult to really know who was uh, infected, how to protect uh, the elder one when we had uh, a spread of the virus in the society. And I just want to have a maybe a comparison with the countries saying they have locked down because even if we were locked down, it would be not possible uh, for the people working in the elder care sector to stay at home because they have to go to their jobs. Uh, so that's where we have been working with. Uh, uh, it has been forbidden by law to visit any of the elder care or nursing homes. Uh, they have the PPE, they have special education about uh, how you have the best possible hygiene rules, how do you work, how do you isolate the infected uh, elder persons from the other ones, um, how do you make sure that the people working in the nursing home don't go between the infected and the not infected persons. But, but that was the most difficult thing to really manage in the beginning of this pandemic. That is not the situation right now, but that was uh, very difficult. And, and we haven't found any proof saying that if we had a lockdown, we would prevent that from happening. Uh, but of course, we are trying to, to evaluate uh, every step we have taken or not taken. So we have a committee of inquiry appointed by the government uh, looking into uh, the whole situation and the whole um, handling of the the, uh, the pandemic in Sweden. Uh, it's not over yet, but so far, and we will start with the, with the elderly. If you do have the conversations about care homes, the retail sector, yep. or opening or closing schools, who's, who's in the conversation at cabinet level? Uh, we have 1,700 nursing homes all over the country. And everyone is run by the municipality or maybe from a, a private owner. Uh, so all of them are responsible 
for their uh, for the, the nursing home, uh, and they have been uh, advised by the National Health Agency, by the uh, Agency for, for Health and Social Affairs. And of course, in the government, we are very eager to make sure that they have the resources they need, that we help them to buy the PPE, which was possible, that was very difficult for, for all the countries when they needed the same PPE at the same time. And, you know, the borders were closed, people, or sorry, not people, but, but countries, uh, companies, they were holding uh, the PPE within their countries to make sure that they have what they need. So we had a lack of PPE, and that was something we tried to, to help the municipalities with um, at the same time as, as they were working uh, on the ground. So uh, municipalities, uh, private owners are responsible but with all the possible help uh, financially, with PPE, with education and knowledge from the national level. Okay, let's move on to... If you come to, sorry, if you come to, if you come to the school, that is uh, the same thing. You could close a school uh, at a local level uh, if you find that um, necessary. Uh, but we have at the national level uh, the, the public health agency uh, advising the government, but the government has decided not to close the preschool or the, um, the primary school up to, to grade nine uh, to make sure that they are open because we couldn't see that that will uh, drive the infection. Uh, on the contrary, we need the, the primary school and, and the preschool to make sure that parents can go to work so that people can work in the health care, the elder care and, and all the other uh, extremely important um, yeah. <laughs> services, businesses at the company. OK, uh, Minister, let's just bring in schools then, because both the Public Health Agency of Sweden and the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare did a recent study of whether schools should open and close. And as you said, you've tried to reopen, whereas Finland actually closed down. I mean, what were the findings? What's the, what, what were the findings of that report in terms of whether it is a good idea to open or close schools during this pandemic? Because it is a hot topic, not just in Europe, but in North America at the moment and in many parts of Asia. As as we get towards September when the new school term and university terms open and start? Really, I think every country has to speak for their own decisions being made or not made. Uh, but in Sweden, we didn't find that necessary to close down the preschool and the primary school because we needed to have them open and we couldn't find in, in the science or in the, the knowledge about uh, the virus that the children and the very young persons will drive uh, the infection. Uh, but we closed down or we said that the, the, the upper secondary school and the universities and the adult learning schools, uh, they were working online with distance courses because otherwise they will travel around so much in, in, the, uh, in the commuter traffic. So that's why we told them or we decided that they should be online. But for the younger children, that was not necessary. And we, we're quite convinced that um, it's very negative for the small children uh, to stay at home, inside uh, with parents just working from home, not meeting uh, friends, not having that kind of stimulation. But I will also say that you have a lot of, of uh, social um, tragic situations uh, with abuse, with uh, domestic violence, those kind of situations which we have to also take into account when we look upon the public health in a broader perspective, uh, but only the coronavirus. So you have to make sure that you have a, a decision making, uh, having that in, in, uh, in mind. OK, well, with, with so many um, infections, uh, with the death rate as it is, uh, there is an official inquiry due at the end of the year. If the inquiry, which is an independent one, blames the government in some shape or form for not doing the right thing or for being partly to blame for the deaths or the infections, would you resign? W would you fall on your sword? Would the Prime Minister resign? Let me start by saying that if you uh, have the opinion that Sweden has so many infected, I would say that we have a situation uh, very well able to compare with many other countries in the European Union, in, in uh, both America, well, I Southern America, I, I do Asia. appreciate, sorry, Minister, so, I, do, so, I do appreciate that there are many countries that have many infections, but there so, is a great deal 
uh, of many questions that the public are asking as to whether their respective lawmakers have made the right decisions. Uh, and in, uh, there's lot, many are being critical of, of their politicians, not just in Sweden, but uh, across the world. So it, it is a general question that if, if you felt that any report came out that said that politicians were to blame, you were to blame, or the Prime Minister was to blame, would you resign? I know you want yes or no, but let me say that it is a situation where the pandemic is not over. I think it's, I think it's dangerous if we are acting uh, as political decision makers, as natural uh, agencies, or as population, as if the pandemic is over and we're just trying to find out whose fault is the fact that we have a situation in our country. Of course, we will look into what, what the result is from this inquiry, but I think it's so early to say. They started a few weeks ago. They have a, a job to do, and they are having a job which is saying that they should, uh, uh, they should follow up and they should evaluate and they should follow the decision makers, both from the government, the natural level, the agencies, but also from the regional and the local part. Because in Sweden, we have a situation where 290 municipalities and 21 regions, they are responsible for the health care, for the elder care, for the schools. We don't have a situation where the government is responsible for everything. But of course, I mean, what is the result? Uh, who is going to be responsible in, in, uh, in someone's uh, opinion? That, that's a later question, but of course, that will come. Well, we're coming very close to the end of the programme, but I just want to mention that Margaret Harris, she's the spokesperson for the WHO, in the last few days, she's just said the virus doesn't appear to follow influenza's seasonal pattern and warned the Northern Hemisphere not to get complacent during the warmer months. Uh, what plans have you got in place for this uh, potential second wave that both the WHO are talking about and various governments are talking about? What's Sweden going to do if a second wave hits your country? I'm not sure if everyone has been hit by the first wave yet, because in Sweden we have a situation where different parts of Sweden has been uh, more infected and more uh, hit than others. Uh, but we are preparing. And uh, just a few weeks ago, the Public Health Agency presented uh, a few scenarios to, to make sure that we are preparing for different situations uh, and from these scenarios, we have other agencies and municipalities and politicians uh, preparing for, for the fall, because we're quite convinced that we will have outbreaks, smaller or bigger ones, maybe not a second wave for the whole country at the same time, but we have to be prepared to act very, very quick uh, in a local or regional level, not only on the national level. So we are preparing, uh, but of course, uh, None of us really know what will happen uh, after summer when we get into fall. Um, what will happen to the virus? Uh, is it acting as we think and hope? Uh, but we are preparing um, in, in every way we can. OK, so very briefly, uh, Minister, you know, you talk about the national and the local level, yet uh, there are many Swedes that might want to go on holiday at this moment in time. And we're seeing spikes again in Spain, in China, uh, and in Australia, as well as Germany. What's your advice to not just Swedes, but generally to a global audience about travelling? Because, you, you know, you would have your experience to advise Swedish nationals about whether they should be travelling abroad or not. Make sure, wherever you are, to uh, be able to have a good hand hygiene, uh, to make sure that you can keep the distance, the social distance, that you don't meet a lot of other people. Uh, if you don't think that's possible, uh, maybe you shouldn't do that trip or, or go to that event. Well, for the moment, we have to leave it there. Sweden's Minister for Health and Social Affairs, Elena Hallingren, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you.